Hello there, I'm Ben Taylorson, and welcome to the House of Hammer. Come on in, let me take your coat, pour yourself something nice and make yourself comfortable. For those of you who are returning guests, welcome back. And for those of you joining us for the first time, we're delighted to have you. But where have you been? For episode number three, it's my honour to be your host and to guide you to the next room in our House of Hammer. So far we've had a nautical mystery with the history of the Mary Celeste and a rousing musical with Song of Freedom. And for this episode we're sticking with the musical theme. Unfortunately for some. Because behind door number three in the House of Hammer is 1936 musical comedy Sporting Love. Based on the stage musical of the same name, Sporting Love is a slapstick farce interspersed with song and dance numbers. And I tell you, if you're a fan of nonsensical song and dance numbers leave it awkwardly into films that appear to be stuck in fast forward, you're in for a treat. Sporting Love stars Stanley Lupino and Laddie Cliff as brothers Percy and Peter, owners of a large country house living a playboy lifestyle, but facing imminent bankruptcy. Why, what's wrong? Is anything the matter? Yes, Dad, be a dreadful temper. He's found out that I've been coming here. And he's going to foreclose on the boys at 2.30 tomorrow. Oh, gosh, I hope he doesn't. He'll have the horses as well. Yes, I know. Oh, Claude, have they any money? Not a sausage. I haven't had any wages for six months. You know, if I wasn't to do a bit of tipping on the course myself, I'd be living on fresh air. Peter! The above has arrived. The brains of the brace family. George, get me a drink. I'm so dry, if you hit me on the back, dust will come out of my mouth. What have we got? There's nothing left but a bottle of vinegar. All right, bring it. I'll get pickled. In an attempt to stave off their debtors, the brothers tell their rich aunt that they've got married so as to secure a large wedding gift. Not married to each other, you understand. It's a strange little film, but it's not that strange. No, I mean married to other people. Just at the same time. Coincidentally. Look, it is a farce, after all. I didn't write it. And how long have you been married? Five years. Five years. Some of these days... Days... I mean five days. Then why did you say years? Well, well, you see, Aunt, it's like this. Uh, Jane. Jane? You said her name was Mona. Oh, did I? Uh, that's right, we call her Jane for short, you see. <laughs> well, uh, Jonah, uh, a main, uh, uh, the wife's been very ill. Oh. oh, well, I'm sure I hope you'll soon be well again. But both your friends. Anyway, even if they are to secure Auntie's wedding check, the brothers are reliant on their horse Moonbeam winning the Epsom Derby to secure their longer-term financial future. With their romantic lives in as much turmoil as their finances, owing to a disapproving would-be father-in-law and the arrival of a long-lost love rival, chaos ensues. Excuse me, sir, have you got your bed? Sir, sorry, I haven't got one. I'm sorry, sir, you mustn't go in. But I must no, go in. No, without a bed. But I say I... Uh, outside, now, outside. wait a minute, wait a minute. He must go in. Oh, why must he go in? We're both owners. Mr. Owners, where are your badges? Yeah, oh, look, this is ridiculous. You can't do a thing like this. Hey, you come back here. Come on, Hey, hey, wait a minute, I'm an owner. You can't... Come on, even when the brothers secure a last-minute tip for the derby that is sure to bring them riches, nothing goes to plan. So, without further ado, let's delve into the movie. And it's a full house this week, as here to discuss sporting love are myself, Kev Moore, Adam Roach, and Smokey. Just Smokey. Like pink, only beige. So, Sporting Love, lads, um, 10 years earlier than uh, Song of Freedom, in feel, I would say, <sighs> no ambition in terms of the medium. I know it's the same year, but it just it feels like there's a decade between the two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Yeah, it feels like a definite step back in time. There's a lot that's very stagey, a lot of fourth wall breaking stuff where you've got Stanley Lupino speaking directly to camera and there's one where his partner, Laddie, they both fall on the couch and look directly into camera and it's as if that's the end of the scene. And it is, you know, the curtain goes down. Mm, it's very much a musical. Yeah, and we talked yeah. about this a little bit in the last episode where we said about there was this transition period between the stage to the screen and there was a, a lot of uncertainty. You can understand why filmmakers were determined maybe not to change too much because they knew what worked and they knew what audiences wanted to see. But here it's really sort of uh, glaring, as you. I mean, Kev, you're absolutely right. That that scene in particular, it it ends like like a theatre scene, and there are several points in this film where they really don't make the the use of the medium. It's just here's a. Mm. I mean, you, you can tell even to be fair, even now in the 21st century, there are films that have clearly been 
reproduce from stage performances that do the same. And I'm not just talking about musicals as well, um, but you can see they haven't used the full sort of promise or, or uh, potential of the medium in which they're now operating. Mm. Yeah, but the, the, the problem was there was a bit of a gold rush, I think, as well, when it comes to uh, like early 30s, late 20s cinemas, because, you know, lots of people were writing films for cinema in the 20s, but they were made for silence, you know? Yeah. It was like they had to be designed for film because they had to have intertitles and everything. All of a sudden you get to 1929 and you go, wow, we've got sound. We can suddenly put music into these things. And all of a sudden they had generations worth of stage plays that could suddenly be immortalized forever and uh, turned into film treats that could be archived and preserved and presented again with the original stars sometimes, perhaps with new stars. So you get films like this, you know, they were absolutely belting the stage coffers in a way, trying to bring as many plays as they could to the screen. And I think that's, it must have been a gold rush for people like Stanley Lupino who'd been writing these plays and could suddenly make, you know, six figures from licensing them to any old film studio. In this case, though, you know, you've got a bit more creative control. But Very true. Yeah, I think that's basically where they were in the state of, you know, cinema at the time. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that, though, Adam, about the, the silent movie thing. I, I think watching this, one of the first things that actually occurred to me while watching it was you could have taken out the dialogue. You could have had a jingly jangly background music playing. You could have had title cards coming up with bits of exposition that were needed. And I still could have followed the plot for what it is as just as well without the dialogue as, as I could with the acting was so over the top. The facial expressions were so embellished. Mm. It was just, it was all mm-hmm. there on the screen, yeah. everything you needed, yeah. you know, the, the playful slaps on people and the, the joviality of, of people looking at each other and the way they express themselves. It could have been a silent film easily. And I don't want to speak out of turn here, I don't think, but it may have been even more enjoyable. To be honest, I'm with you, Smokey, on that. I feel like it would have been a lot more straightforward. The film starts with a narrator, and I feel like that was ditched way too early. The film really did need him to be in at least three other scenes just to try and recap, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> you did need a roach recap in this film. <laughs> <laughs> please, please don't mention that. <laughs> I think the ultimate irony for me is that this film and Song of Freedom that feel so very different were both directed by the same man. So J. Elder Wills <laughs> yeah. directed both of them. Um, although we would argue perhaps Paul Robeson perhaps directed uh, Song of Freedom and there's a, a, you know, you may be inclined to think that really Stanley Lupino was perhaps the driving force behind this, but on the credits, it's J. Elder Wills. And um, to tell us a little bit more about J. Elder Wills, uh, this episode is Smokey. Like Shakira, only his hips do lie. For our third Hammer Hero, the distinguished honour goes to J. Elder Wills. Born in London on April 26th of the year 1900, with the full and slightly unnecessary name of James Ernest Elder Wills, J. Elder was something of a jack of all trades. Oh, we don't need any more names. He, he was something of a renaissance man. Writer, producer, designer and director, J. Elder, also known as Bunty <laughs> to some, was also one of Hammer's very first board members joining the company from the beginning of its endeavours in November of 1934. J. Elder primarily worked at the Theatre Royal on Drury Lane, gaining valuable experience as a scenic artist before turning his attention to the medium of film in 1927 with the silent war drama Poppies of Flanders. His work as a designer continued throughout the 1920s and 30s, including The Informer in 1929, the Gracie Fields and John the Brighton Strangler Loader vehicle Sing As We Go in 1934, and most notably for this particular show anyway, The Mystery of the Mary Celeste in 1935. A career in directing inevitably followed, but before we get there, a special mention must be made for his wartime career. Rising to the rank of colonel in the British Army during World War II, his talents, particularly his work as an art director, were noticed and put to very good use. 
The Inter-Services Research Bureau, or ISRB, was a secret British special operations executive factory tasked with making special weapons and equipment during the Second World War. Bunty then apparently wanted to be a precursor to Q from James Bond as he led the team in charge of designing, signing and building camouflaged explosive devices for agents to use when operating against the German and Japanese forces. Some of the items included were hidden radio transmitters, exploding milk bottles, detonating pens and cigarettes that went off in your face. And more awesomely and most disgustingly of all, booby traps that were concealed in animal dung. And they weren't clueless about this either. Camel droppings were used for the desert, similarly horse for Europe, but, and you get the picture. His wartime exploits were put to use, using a story of his own experiences, in the 1948 film Against the Wind. But, as promised, back to his showbiz career as a director. His introduction to the medium was with a series of puppeteering shorts, all produced in 1930. His live-action debut followed in 1931, with the Cockney-rific sounding mmm blimey, featuring the debut of Edie Martin, which Jay Elder also co-wrote. The anime Wong picture Tiger Bay soon followed in 1934, before he went on to helm two films for Hammer, our previous room's Song of Freedom and our current stop on the tour, Sporting Love, both from 1936. It certainly appears that Jay Elder was a fan of wearing several hats, as he was also Sporting Love's art director, even though he went under his nickname of Bunty and shared the credit with fellow designer Norman Arnold. Following the demise of Hammer in 1937 and his wartime experiences, Wills went to work as a designer for other studios, working on such productions as the aforementioned Against the Wind in 1948 and 1951's Valley of Eagles and Blackmailed. However, following Hammer's revival in 1946, he returned to the fold, designing many low-budget productions for the company, among them 1955's The Quatermass Experiment, which turned out to be his last one for Hammer, thus leaving the door open for Bernard Robinson to take over his mantle for the designing of the forthcoming Gothic Horrors. Now, here is where things get a little trickier. Conflicting sources put his name and many nicknames and pseudonyms on several pictures and features over the 40s and the 50s. We are certain, however, that his involvement on The Mystery of the Mary Celeste, Song of Freedom, and of course this episode, Sporting Love, is not up for debate. So it would have been, quite frankly, diabolical of us to not make J. Elder Wills our next Hammer hero. But when the remaining years of his life, before his passing at the age of 69 in 1970, are a little bit foggy to say the least, maybe it's best to leave it to someone else's words to have the final say. Elizabeth Welch, Paul Robeson's co-star from Song of Freedom, seemed to sum up J. Elder Willis rather well. He was a known director, he was a charming man, and that's all I know. So speaking of charming men... We have a pair of brothers here who are land rich, cash poor, as you might call it. So they're uh, they've got this country house mansion, if you will, um, but they've got no liquidity whatsoever. So we have a scenario where they're living and they're they've 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 got a party lifestyle. They've got all the girls around, but they've actually got no money. And this is actually more common than I thought in films. It happens time and time again. It's actually quite an interesting plot device mm. yes total uh like pg woodhouse it's just everyone's poor in a pg woodhouse story but they all have a rich aunt and they all own lots of property but what they do is they somehow seem to you know live off you know getting shipments in from the butcher and the and the, the wine merchant and putting off payment until next month <laughs> it happens all the time so total yeah, 20 even thing. into the man of born that mm. did the similar thing Oh, is it yeah. Brighthead Revisited that does the same as well? I think there's a real trope yeah. because of what happened in the First World War, basically, is that these houses became, you know, their servants went off to war and they didn't come back. And I think we end up in a scenario, and I mean, particularly after the Second World War, where these houses were demolished at a rate of like two a week because the people who'd owned them just couldn't afford to keep them anymore. Mm, that's mm. very true, yeah. There are many other instances on film where you see this. I mean, one in particular that occurred to me while watching this a much more recent film, uh, Rush, based obviously on on true events. It's about James Hunt, the racing driver, who is funded by um, Lord Hesketh, who um, who funded the Hesketh racing team, was uh, in a very similar position. Um, you know, champagne, girls, parties all the time uh, until he ran out of money, frankly, um, which is 
you know exactly what we find the um the lead uh, characters in this film have done speaking about the uh champagne lifestyle i mean you you start off the film with all the girls in the swimming pool which again plays into my rule of swimming pools the swimming pool rule is if you see a swimming pool in a film somebody's going to end up in it later on and it plays out in this as well but the narrator on this he says um pretty girls haven't a care in the world or have they it's just such a weird piece of commentary it's also a dangerously <laughs> small swimming pool for the amount of people pouring into it at the beginning i'd argue there's about 48 of them they'd be clattered heads galore i'm telling you <laughs> <laughs> no ducking no bombing no petting no pet. <laughs> and that's just this podcast <laughs> <laughs> No, I, mean, I think even something like the, uh, the the swimming pool scene, which is going back to what we were saying before, is it, arguably trying to make more of the of the medium, the cinematic medium, because they can sort of do that. Whereas I don't imagine on on the stage they would have had that kind of setup. But it really does keep reminding me that that this was a, a, a sort of a stage musical that was written by Stanley Lupino. He was in it, um, as were a lot of the rest of the cast as well, um, and for many yeah. showings, over three hundred showings. So. Let's hear more, in fact, about the uh, Lupino um, dynasty from Adam Roach. Let's do that. It's Lupino time. Or should I say, Lupino time. The Lupinos actually began in show business back in the 17th century. Giorgio Lupino, double P, was a puppeteer who fled his native Italy in search of safety during political upheaval and found it on English shores. Giorgio was rather fond of his own name and even fonder of the English version of it. His firstborn son, George Lupino, carried on his father's traditions and became a puppeteer. And so did his son, George Lupino. This third generation, George Lupino, had two sons, George and George, both dancers. One wonders how difficult it must have been to ask for the salt at the Lupino family table. However, the fifth George decided that it was time for the curse to be broken and named his son Thomas. He also performed as a dancer and when he had a son, he named him Samuel George. But enough about the Lupinos and their army of Georges. During the first breath of the 19th century, the youngest scions of the Lupino dynasty took to the stage with other acts, sometimes incorporating their talents with those of others. Among these fellow theatrical types was one, I kid you not, George Hook, who liked the sound of the Lupino name and decided to adopt it for his own, with one small variation. In order to make it sing a little, he dropped one of the P's and became George Lupino. This George Lupino sired an exhausting 16 children, 13 of which declined to pursue a life in the arts, but three did. Harry Lupino, Arthur Lupino, who earned the grand renown of acting as the stage's first ever Nana the Dog in J.M. Barry's production of Peter Pan. And finally, you guessed it. George Lupino. This George Lupino, bear with me, the seventh, I think seventh, could be sixth, George Lupino had three sons, all performers, Stanley Lupino, Mark Lupino, and George Lupino. Fear not, we've exhausted our Georges for now. We will focus instead upon Stanley, the star of Sporting Love. Stanley's career began at the age of six in 1899 when he played various animals in plays as a child. He then worked as a prizefighter, an acrobat, and finally an actor in pantomimes such as Sleeping Beauty and Dick Whittington. But aside from a love of performing, Stanley Lupino could see the value in creating behind the scenes. In his spare time, he would write plays and books. He was especially adept at comedy. Sporting Love is itself based upon a stage production he himself wrote, and which played for 302 performances upon English stages in 1934. Film was, of course, the next step, and bearing such a hallowed and revered name as Lupino certainly allowed him to carve out a modestly successful career as both actor and writer. 
This love of performance and of shaping the production himself was a passion he successfully bred into his daughters, Rita and Ida. He built for them a small theatre in their back garden and encouraged them to write plays and perform in them. Rita would go on to become a successful dancer in her own right, but it was Ida Lupino who would carry the torch of the Lupino name through the 20th century, as the music hall and vaudeville for which her family had become known began to fade into obscurity. As an actress, she was remarkably successful and was swiftly snapped up by Hollywood, appearing in such hits as The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes with Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, and most famously High Sierra opposite Humphrey Bogart. But her disinclination to play a glamour girl, and instead master the crafts behind the camera, put her in square opposition with Warner Studio head Jack L. Warner. When she refused to star in King's Row with Ronald Reagan, she was placed on suspension and spent the time observing technicians and developing her own style as a writer and director. Ida Lupino carved out a name for herself by directing social commentary films. Her movie, Outrage, bravely dealt with the aftermath of a rape. Strong stuff for 1950. The Bigamist from 1953, not surprisingly, dealt with bigamy. However, she never forgot that movies were meant to entertain and found a particular niche in the noir genre. Her seminal work in this field was 1953's The Hitchhiker, a grueling thriller with an all-male cast that has been praised ever since as a powerful study in toxic masculinity. When she died in 1995, so too did the Lupino legacy upon entertainment and popular culture. But for almost three centuries, one dynasty ruled the stages and sound stages of the world. One name guaranteed a sparkling night's entertainment. The fabulous Lupinos. Who were mostly called George. So I can guarantee that none of us are called George, to my knowledge. And let's talk about the two leads. So we've got uh, um, Stanley Lupino and uh, Laddie Cliff. Uh, What do we think? Very stagey. Um, it's really funny as well because obviously I'm watching Stanley Lupino's performance and there's a lot of vaudeville touches like his crazy Max Wall walk at the opening credits and then there's a little bit of business with his hat where he lifts his hat when he stands up against a uh, pillar, I think it is. And these are all things that you see popping up again in comedy since, you know, like the, the hat gag definitely uh, was used by Morecambe and Wise more than one occasion obviously max wall but yeah the the interplay between these two as well you know you can see that these have been working this on stage like the marx brothers did over in the states so they've got it down to an absolute fine art and can really bang it out which probably means this is why this seems like it crams in more in its 46 minutes runtime on this one isn't it yeah yeah Mm. yeah than what it does on mary celeste you know, where everybody's kind of stood about waiting for somebody else to say the next line. On this, you've got practically people tripping up on each other's lines. It's that fast. I don't think there's any question about the chemistry the two have. They obviously work together well. You buy that they're brothers and they do have a history together. But my yeah. my problem was that it was just pushing for the laughs and not always in a space where a laugh was needed. For me personally, it was more misses than hits where that was concerned but if if we're talking just generally about their performances i can't grumble about the performances because i believed what they were doing and they did it actually rather well so you know uh, stanley lupino he, he obviously had talent and he was obviously a gifted comic actor as well as anything else and if we are to believe that he did direct this as well fair enough that's fine i mean i know we've said it's just a static camera mainly in a in a one room situation but that's fine. I mean, it worked, didn't it? You know, it was, I, I didn't yeah. miss anything. And so it just, it worked for me in the fact that I followed the plot. I believe these two were brothers. And yeah, I mean, you can't really ask for much more out of someone's performance. True. Well, I'm happy to grumble about them. Uh, it's no problem <laughs> yeah. at all. I think it's because they were just too similar. It was like, almost like they took the perfect asshole. And what they did was they split him in two. And then they had him talk to the other 
and smack against each other and wink at the camera and then turn around and grab a girl and just say, you're mine now, blah, 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 and then do a tap dance. And then the other one is also doing the same thing. I remember thinking all the time, I would prefer if, <laughs> if that swimming pool was full of hydrochloric acid and both of them just fell into it. So, yes, I wasn't a fan <laughs> of Stanley Lupino. I just thought they were fine. I thought the interplay between them was, worked well. I mean, I, you know, I just thought that, as I said, it was just too forced for my liking, but I thought they mm. worked well together. It might be with looking at it with a certain degree of 21st century perspective, but I did find the interplay between the two leads and the rest of the cast weird. I mean, they were very, very mm. camp. I would say they were far too old for the parts they were, should be playing. Either that or the parts had been infantilized for the style of acting mm. that they yes. had. Uh, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, 100%. If you imagine this, take away one of them, would this story still have worked? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it yeah. would have worked easier. Yeah. Exactly. What's the yeah. point? What's the point in having two of them? They're literally the same character. Just a little, 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 little. Like it's one falls in love, the other falls in love. They both do exactly the same thing. They both do exact they go both go through exactly the same story. And at the end, they both <laughs> walk off back towards the sunset. Literally, what's the point of having two of them? I just don't get it. It would just doubled the pain. I hadn't thought of it that way, but <laughs> No, you're enough. absolutely right. Yeah, is- I'll give you that. They also had the same sort of horrific uh, trait of infantilizing the females they were with and talking to them like they were children. Oh, oh that was crazy. God, which, yes. which, <laughs> excruciating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that poor woman just breaks down outside the house. So she knocks on the door, pop, pop, pop. Hi, could you help me, please? Yes. But first, I'm going to feel you up. And then I'm going to sit you down on the sofa and feel you up some more. Then I'm going to apply you with booze. And by the way, we're now in a relationship. And uh, I'm going to tap dance in front of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just. <laughs> Can, can we talk about that? The unnecessary tap dance. Oh my word! Where did that come from? It wasn't even like it was unnecessary. It was like it was almost like they just smashed two films together. Yeah, yeah. I honestly th- I thought I'd had. I th- honestly thought I had a stroke. And then walking up watching it. <laughs> you just, it was almost like you know when you like fall asleep and you wake up and you're like, where am I? Yeah. <laughs> and your neck, your neck hurts, and you realise you're still sat outside the pub, and the landlord's <laughs> just gone home. That's basically what this film's like. All of a sudden, there's someone talking to someone, and then you blink, and that person's gone, and they're in a totally different scene. He's <laughs> yeah. feeling up some woman. He's being annoying to his twin it's just oh, I mean, well, oh what a film <laughs> <laughs> the thing is though is like right i know we kind of joke about it and my dislike of musicals and dance and things like that but this made me want to kill myself this was excruciating why that why it just i was watching a barely passable comedy and then they as you said adam they smashed in a, a tap dancing sequence that just made me question why I was even on this podcast. It was just, it was just. Do you wrong. know what? Is it hundred percent with you, Smokey? This film was sixty-seven uh. minutes long, and the version that's f- available today is forty-six uh. minutes long, and it feels like forty-six hours. It yeah. just goes on forever. Yeah. It's like I, I watched this thing. I, uh, you, you, I spoke to you before this podcast started. I watched this film, and, I, I, and an hour after it finished, I was like. I don't remember a thing about this film. So I, I waited until a couple of days ago and watched it again. I was like, I must, surely if I watch it again, that's going to jog the old memory. Watched it again and I came to you tonight, still not knowing what happened. <laughs> mm. film. It's, no. it's just, I've never experienced any kind of piece of entertainment like it. The <laughs> one that just refuses, refuses to take any, any kind of room in my memory. It's just it, it, really it refuses odd. refuses to die. Really odd. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but also as well. I do, all I remember is my brain. It's like it's like like sporting love from nineteen. Please, can you tell me what that film was about, please, brain? And I get this banner going, restricted, <laughs> restricted. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like no, we wiped that thing for a reason. No, no. Hearing you talking about it tonight has just made me made me realise, you know, exactly. <laughs> I really didn't I didn't dig it at all. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I've watched this several times now, and the last couple of times I've watched it, I watched it in 10-minute segments because I figured that would work better. And to a certain extent, it did, because it there's so much that happens in each scene or, you know, set up. You need to take it in, and the way that it's so rapid fire, it's a lot to keep up with. Again, you've got the double plot device, you know, with both guys doing exactly the same and both shouting different names out 
and you're not sure who's who and it doesn't help by the fact that the two leads are both playing the same part with the same pitch. And they're both sexually molesting women all the way through it. Yep. You're obsessed. Yep. They are as well. <laughs> I found it really uncomfortable. This poor woman's broken down. Yeah. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. Are you local? And then his aunt walks in the room and she goes, yeah, she's mine now. Yeah. This is my bird. <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> she doesn't at one point go, um... I'm not actually interested in you, you creepy little 48-year-old man. <laughs> well, it was... So it's just strange. They were 43 and 45-year-old, so it was strange to start off with, wasn't they it? Older. Because the... <laughs> yeah, the female leads were a lot younger than that. Can we, yeah. can we talk that about the wow. ant character? You've mentioned her there, Adam. So you've got this kind of trope, sort of ant penny bags sort of your opposite to Uncle Pennybags. <laughs> yeah. I have the money, but I have nothing else to offer this plot type uh, character. They, they turn up all the time, <laughs> which was, was interesting. But I actually thought she worked quite well, and I thought her character was quite underdeveloped yeah. because we have a character that comes into the, um, into the script who is, is meant to be um, someone who is uh, engaged to one of the younger women. She's, uh, again, it's another horrifically awful um relationship mm. where he's clearly like 155 years old and she's sort of 20. <laughs> what I felt was that there was a, a, a possible relationship developing between him and the Ant character that never went anywhere, admittedly. But um, but I quite liked mm. what she brought. She was that sort of stoic, older, I have all the money, I'm watching you all sort of try and run rings around me, but you all rely on me totally to write you a check type thing. And it's it's, yeah, we've seen it all before, but I quite like that. She's um she's actually the best character in it, I would mm. say, and I kind of missed her when she went at the end. And like you say, that is a total trope from that sort of period. You know, look at Woodhouse, all those kinds of you know drawing room comedies. The importance of being earnest. There's always a rich aunt that saves the day. But with this one, there's no groundwork done at the beginning. So with with Woodhouse on a, and a clever writer, they would uh, put the aunt in at the beginning and they would make them a nemesis or an adversary in some kind, of some kind. And then when they came to the rescue in the third act, you would go, oh, they were cool all along. Wow. Yeah. I didn't see that coming. With this, it's almost like, you know, it's all like, you know, <laughs> we're... You know, we're likely lads and we're going to bet all this money and we're going to ha- flirt with all these women and stuff. And now I don't know where to go with the plot. I don't know how I'm going to get myself out of this. So I'm going to write myself in a rich aunt and just drop her in and say, <laughs> here we go, guys, here's some money. It doesn't work, I don't think, in this in this case. It did It did just yeah, feel a bit um, lazy, didn't it? It felt like a, an easy out. Well, that's it. It's it's just the deus ex machina. (laughs) Beautiful. (laughs) The exact same thing happens with the uh, the Lord uh, Dimsdale character as well, who is the one that that, that early on in the film we think is going to be their saviour. And then they seem to annoy him, and yet there's a missing 100 minutes of the film or something. And and we come back to the film, and it's like, oh, no, he's on our side. He's cool now. And it's like you say, the arc of him going from being not cool to being cool is just cut out of the film entirely and sort of conveniently he's then on the side of the two main characters and they they do that exact same thing with the ant although she admittedly gets a little bit more um of a of a narrative to work with don't you think that um most of the time when you see these films and there's huge chunks of them missing like this one is you know 67 minutes down to 46 you think to yourself man i hope someone finds those 21 minutes one day I actually hope they find a shorter version. <laughs> it's not often I say that, but yeah, I kind of, I kind of would like a yeah shorter version. <laughs> find less, find less of it. I've got to agree with you there and say that this is the longest forty-six minute long movie I've ever seen. <laughs> it, I honestly didn't know it was possible for forty-six minutes to drag the way this does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, as you said, there was a little bit at the beginning, and then there was a ten-minute chunk at the end where it was fairly entertaining, you know. Especially the bit at the, the racetrack, which we'll get to towards the end. I thought that was all right. That was fine. I was quite entertained by that. But everything else, it was just like I just want this to stop now. If we are literally going to, as we are doing, going chronologically through Hammer, so we've had Mary Celeste, and we've had the Song of Freedom, and then we've had this. This is a, for me personally is a massive step backwards in quality in storytelling yeah. 
in everything. I was surprised when you said it, Ben, that you preferred this over Mary Celeste, because for me, Mary Celeste is head and shoulders above this in terms of quality and in terms of acting and in terms of peril or, you know, the people who are in dire straits, then it's just, this is just, what a mess, what a mess this film is. <laughs> I, just, I can't get over it. I can't get over it. And I don't ever want to see it again. Well, let's then with those words ringing in our ears. Let's um, <laughs> sorry. Let's <laughs> let's move to the uh, the conclusion, as you say, which is 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 based around the um, the horse race, which is central, obviously, to the title of the film and mm. and to the plot, kind of. Mm. Um, so this is is shot on stage. It's shot in a studio, yet it's interspersed quite nicely with stock footage of the Epsom Derby to make it look like they're at the racetrack. I think that works quite effectively. Yeah. All right, and um, to yeah. feed us into um, a little bit more about uh, how sports and films have interacted over the years, we're going to listen to a little snippet from Kev Moore. Smokey, a man well known for his displeasure with musicals, ended up hosting an episode about that very thing. Ben? the most sportsmanlike amongst us, followed that logic through and thought it would be a hoot for me, his polar opposite, to talk to you about sports movies. The sports movie isn't something that started with Steve McQueen throwing a baseball in The Great Escape. It goes much further back than that. But compared to boxing, baseball and an absolute deluge in motor racing films, horse racing, for some reason, isn't as well represented despite being the sport of kings. We can only speculate as to why Stanley Lupino chose to centre his sporting love play around the derby. It's more than likely down to the instant recognition and excitement generated from a mere mention of the event. After all, it was the event that Emily Davison of the Suffragettes chose to stage a protest at by running in front of the king's horse in 1913. It was the first to be shown as a live BBC broadcast in 1931, with the entire royal family, including that troubling Prince of Wales, in full attendance. Indeed, Queen Elizabeth herself has been a regular visitor for nearly 70 years and saw her first race just four days after her coronation. Such is the prestige of the Epsom Derby that it's one of the very first horse races to be filmed way, way back in 1895. Unfortunately, the story of sporting love isn't uncommon when it comes to horse racing. The sport itself usually plays second fiddle to stories of fortunes won or lost at the track with crime or redemption abound, but very few are focused on the event itself. This is a shame because when it is more central to the plot, films such as the award-winning National Velvet and Sea Biscuit, or the 1952 British Portmanteau Derby Day where Epsom itself is front and centre, are great examples of this albeit small section of a much larger picture. By adapting Lupino's play to the big screen and using stock footage of Epsom to set up the whole thing, Hammer smartly tapped into audiences with voracious appetites for both. Despite decent returns though, Hammer Films wouldn't visit the racetrack again. So Hammer may not have uh, visited the racetrack again. But uh, let me ask you, chaps, would you visit this particular racetrack again? Kev, let me hear your opinions on uh, sporting love. I think it's it's a tricky one to recommend. It's enjoyable enough. There's enough in it that made me chuckle. And repeated viewings have made me chuckle again, which is always good. But I do kind of gravitate to this sense of humour sometimes anyway. Um, it's a decent piece of froth and it makes such a change especially for Hammer to do something like this it's quite an adventure yeah I, I would say it's an enjoyable enough farce Smoky? Uh, I mean you already kind of know where I'm coming from but being objective which which I can be every now and again is if you're looking for a farcical easy time i suppose and you're a fan of this type of comedy okay i could i i I, it's not a genre that i'm massively well versed in so would i recommend it on the strength of that if you're a fan yeah it's a curio i suppose you could check it out i think though for 
my likes and dislikes and my uh, sensibilities when it comes to when it comes to films i uh, hated every second um <laughs> and i have no desire ever to view this thing again i would much rather see something we kind of half joked about in the last episode which was a sort of volume one and volume two of song of freedom you know one hour set in london one hour set in uh, in africa <laughs> imagine yeah, if I'd, this was volume one of song of freedom brilliant then one. i would not be on this podcast anymore so it's um <laughs> no it, uh, and then you you throw in in the middle of a farce you throw in a tap dance and then you throw in a musical number and no 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 so but um if you like me don't watch it if you're like anyone else do watch it how's that <laughs> so uh, adam uh i'm i'm kind of i'm so on the fence here like i i actually hated the experience of watching this film I just say, no you're not you're not on the fence <laughs> at all you're, you're just clearly on the wrong side of the fence <laughs> sat in the compost team is where you are <laughs> no, not that fence. Okay. Another fence, like the, the one, like we, you know. Here's the fence, and you say, you know, on there, on that side of things, you like it. On that side of things, you hate it. I'm on that fence. <laughs> yeah, no, I, no, I, I didn't enjoy this film. Strangely, though, I I look back on some moments quite fondly. Like the last 15 minutes of the film, I actually really like, but I don't think it's worth putting yourself through the grueling 28 minutes beforehand to get there, which is something I never thought I'd say about a film because yeah. <laughs> 28 minutes, why wouldn't you spend that on a setup? The, as Smokey said, the longest 46 minutes of my life, and I've done it twice. <laughs> I won't do it again. Good man. All right, I'd rather spend my time on the Mary Celeste. <laughs> Literally. <There you> go. <laughs> well, unlike you, Joyless Wonders, um, I, I, I quite enjoyed this, I have to say. Um, oh, he has to be different. No, I did. I did you know, I, I laughed out loud. Um, I've watched it three times. I laughed out loud every time. Yep. Um, yeah, it's missing chunks. It's dated. It's weird. It dashes from scene to scene. It's, you know, <laughs> it, it's a, a product of its time. The chemistry on screen is enough for me to have enjoyed it. And yeah, I think I would give this a recommend. It's a shame that the only existing copy is is not the greatest quality as well. I think it's not something we've really talked about, is that it's quite difficult to watch because of the quality of mm. the of the cut that's left. But um, but no, I enjoyed this for what it is. I'd agree that to a certain extent that um but there's better stuff out there, it's fair to say. Um and I look forward to finding that throughout the course of this podcast. <laughs> Just throw a stone. I, 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 I want to hit a better film somewhere. I, I'm off to watch. Uh, I'm off to watch. Uh, I'm off to watch Norbit. <laughs> well, actually, I'm I'm off to watch reruns of Benson because we've all glossed over the fact that the butler in this film is an absolute steal of a character. He's great. I just lo- I just love the random paths you pick. <laughs> So oh yeah. I'm gonna go for Benson. Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. So listener, I'd urge you to uh seek this out. It's available uh, to watch on YouTube and make up your own mind because uh, for goodness sakes, don't listen to us. <laughs> so there you have it. An entertaining discussion of sporting love with some of the finest podcasters out there. And me as well. And now, our attention turns to what lurks behind door number four in the House of Hammer. Is it another musical? Well, praise every known deity, it's thankfully not. In fact, Hammer's next movie, 1936's Bank Messenger Mystery, the tale of a bank cashier who teams up with criminals to rob the bank he's been fired from, is sadly a missing film. Which means we'll be moving forward in time to 1947 for the next episode, with a British crime whodunit. Will it be Veronica Rose with the lead piping in the dress shop? Well, you'll have to wait to find out. If you've enjoyed listening to this episode, be sure to subscribe and give us a nice rating on your podcatcher of choice. If you'd like to follow us for updates and get in touch, you can do so via Twitter and Instagram, where we are at HouseHammerPod. You can also drop us an email via scream at houseofhammerpodcast.com. And so, from myself, Ben Taylorson. From me, Kev Moore. From me, Smokey. From me, Adam Roach. We wish you well until you return again to the House of Hammer. Hammer.